All right, everybody, welcome back. Welcome back to the Sons of Montezuma podcast. We're going live. All going right, live. everybody, we welcome. We're going to do it live. <laughs> in the words of one Daniel Morton. I'm, I'm not going to go there, though. What's going on, everybody? We're, <laughs> we're glad you guys are joining us, all, all five of you. Of course, I am your host, Mateo San Diego. And if this is your first time checking us out, you know that we talk nothing but Aztec sports, football, basketball, badminton, golf, tennis, all those good things. The diamonds, everything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Obviously, I am joined with my two co-hosts. He's protecting our borders from sea to shining sea. He's a wild man. He, he went on a crazy bender in Vegas, and that's all I'm going to say because nobody needs to know anything more. It's K5 James. What's up? What's up? Good to be here. Good to do it live. All right. Andy said we sound good, right? We sound good. All right. And down at the bottom, because he is dirty like that. He's from the streets, the mean streets <laughs> of San Carlos. <laughs> <laughs> we got the man at Morton 78 on Twitter. The dirtiest of the dance. Dirtball Dan, what's up, man? What's going on, guys? How you doing? I'm still, dude, I'm still run down from Vegas, actually. Yeah, yeah, I'm feeling it, man. Like I said, as soon as we get off the, as soon as we get off the air today, I'm going to bed. <laughs> <laughs> but well. hey, if, there, if, if you're going to watch the Aztecs lose, there isn't a better way to do it, right? Oh man, that that stadium swim! If you guys have never done it, it is incredible. It was so much fun. That cabana was like perfect. The weather was perfect. Everything except for the game was great. Hey, Talk we need to Circa. get a paid. We need a paid sponsorship for Circa. Circa pool was amazing. We were on the rooftop, like just the incredible game was on the biggest of the big screens. We were worried that it wasn't like we were gonna have to be in the cabana watching it all huddled together, like all hot and sweaty in Vegas, watching, you know, just uncomfortable. But it was on the big screen, man. That was, it was incredible. I, I wish we could share a screen of the videos that we took, but I tried to share a few on, on social media. Dude, could you imagine the, the raging that would have happened if they won? I mean, when they were up 13, nothing, uh, we were, um, uh, but they were already, we were already talking victory shots, all these <laughs> <laughs> Who knew after after we jinxed it, they'd, they'd go on a 35-0 run. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that, that brings us to what we're actually here to talk about, and that's the game, right? I mean, what were we looking at, guys? 35 unanswered points, the final score, Boise State 35, Aztecs 13, and uh, yeah, we didn't have those victory shots, right? But that didn't stop us from having a good time. Once again, our travel routine is to always make sure we do enough to have a great time regardless of the outcome of the game but the Aztecs say hey, 13 points in that first half and it was weird because we were enjoying it we were loving it we were you know obviously up and you anytime you shut down Boise State to zero in the first half like I don't remember they said it, it was like at least like what 20 years since they've been shut out in the first half or something something ridiculous like that well well we were loving it and hating it at the same time, right? Because <laughs> it was all like what should have been, what could have been, um, the frustration of watching some of the drives. Even when you're partying and drinking, it's it's you. It's so frustrating still. It, it's still frustrating. All the third and long running running plays, still, and then um, just the way they scored. Nothing was offensively. It was everything was done with special teams and defense. So. It was still a lot of the same that we've had to watch these last these first four weeks. And uh, yeah, that was it was rough, man. It was it was rough. We were excited, but it was it was rough. I mean, we came into this game like it was a fascinating game because we all know the temperature was right. We didn't need to be in Vegas to know that it was it was going to be a heated contest. I mean, we hate Boise. They hate us. You know, we had on John Mallory from the ticket up there in Idaho and you know when we were hearing him talk all about Taylor Green it was like okay okay like slow your roll dude it's his first start you know getting a new offensive coordinator so there was a lot at play for them but just on our side we knew what the temperature was we knew that this game was going to be like a, a a prove it or lose it type of uh, attitude right because 
13 points, no offensive touchdowns in that first half. And that wasn't even the bad part. The bad part was all the penalties. Like me and Dan were in the water and just every single flag, every single penalty. We were looking at each other like again, like we're forecasting it almost towards the end of that second quarter. It was like, here comes another one, you know? I mean, we had a touchdown wiped away because of an illegal man downfield, which, you know, I think that was kind of bogus. I mean, he was maybe like a yard over over the line of scrimmage. But these are the type of things that happen when you have a bad offense. And the, the false starts, like the, I think we get into the red zone or get to the 10-yard line on two different times. It starts with the false start. I want to say it was like back-to-back plays. Dude. They had yeah, two false starts. Like, Man, it's just, and they're doing like, you know, the silent count or the clap thing. And they haven't been able to master that um, all year. And it, it's just, and it, and it was, it's all of them. It's everybody on the offensive line. Yeah, dude, it's um, the, the pre snap penalties. We talked, we've been, we sound like a broken record the last three or four games. It just seems like those pre snap penalties are killers. And that stuff that, that's like coaching and that's, you know, attention to detail. And I think that's kind of why a move had to be made. Um, we can talk about that in a little bit, but yeah, it was, it was just unbelievable the way they continued to shoot themselves in the foot even when they had a little spark of something on offense. Now, the news is already out there. Everybody knows. But, you know, I was really, I, I was trying to be hopeful, right? I mean, we don't want the team to lose. We don't want the team to perform bad. Uh, so, I mean, there's always going to be hope there that, you know, I think Dan said it last week. He's like, look, we want them to prove us wrong. We want, you know, Coach Eklis, like, prove us wrong. If you guys go out and put up 30 a game, like, we'll gladly be wrong. You know, <laughs> like, we want we want to have our, our predictions and, and our attitude adjusted. But, you know, just the penalties alone in that first half was enough to really just – we're all looking at each other like this is just not it's not right and then the play of the game which to me coming out in that second half the first play i mean we were up 13 nothing we had a, a you know a few missed opportunities to score the touchdown in the first half you come out in the second half and you're thinking okay we could build upon this lead let's see the offense run down and, and get a score of some sort and the very first you know passing opportunity is picked off it was it I mean, was one of the worst pass plays I've ever seen in my life. I mean, it was yeah. Like I don't I don't know where how you could miss so bad and I don't I mean they're kids or they're young people so I don't want to rail too hard on it but yeah. Man, it really felt like you know it just took the wind out from the cell. Like I was we just looked at each other like you could just feel that something changed with that. You know you. Yeah, I said it. I said it earlier on Twitter, and we talked about it, Dan. Like that, that interception pretty much broke the team. Like they, yeah. there was no coming back from that. And you can see it the way the defense played in the second half. Like, what did Boise have rushing in the first half? Forty yards, something like that. Thirty-five yards. They, they couldn't run the ball at all in the first half. And all of a sudden, boom! They started breaking these five, six, seven, eight, ten-yard runs back to back to back. And Boise didn't have to throw the ball. They just the team had basically thrown in the towel. Like I said, I, I'm not saying it's a conscious thing. They just said they were quitting. I think it kind of just subconsciously, like the momentum and everything shifted. And they were just like, let's go home. Like this is – the offense is going to get us back in this game. We're done. Like, that's the, the the vibe I got from the team. Yeah, and I don't – like I saw some pushback a little bit online. but And it's not so much that like we're saying they quit or whatever, but it's been a season long of having to deal with being on the field nonstop, dealing with an offense that cannot do anything. At some point, you might your energy level and your fight might go down one or two percent. They may not know. And one percent, one or two, five percent in your energy level and your confidence could mean everything. It could change the whole, the whole, your whole attitude, your whole, the whole momentum of the game. And I and, and we said this as it's something like subconsciously. They don't even know. They're trying, they think they're trying the hardest. They think they're playing the hardest, but you know, it's just, it's a lot of weight that's been on the defense all year. And look, the defense hasn't been perfect either, but 
at the same time, man, like when you have that last game, Toledo, with how poor our offense was, and then the first half um, in Boise with how poor it is, and then that first interception, it's just so deflating. It's hard to stay on point, and it's something that could happen in any team, professional or college. Yeah. So it was we weren't question integrity or anything stupid like that. Yeah. Well, Braxton threw that pick, and after that happened, okay, the attitude, I'm sure we, we could feel it all the way in Vegas. But then I don't know how you miss that targeting call. If you're a ref and you see Skinner just come down and absolutely nail Braxton helmet to helmet, the side of the helmet, the kid is on the sidelines concussed. They're reviewing it. Like, how do you not call that targeting? I mean, I'm, I'm, I, it got me heated. I'm not going to be that upset because the game is what it is. But, man, I mean, the kid is obviously concussed on the sideline. Like, the proof is there. You see it. I, I don't I, know how that, you know, stopped the refs from making that decision. I, I wish we could hear the announcers on that part, actually. Yeah. Because I think I was telling you at the time, I'm not sure if it's true. I don't know if they deemed him a runner. Just like it would be like a running back getting hit in the head after they go through the middle. I'm not sure. I don't know the rule that well, I guess. But it was too clear and concise of a hit for them to say it wasn't helmet to helmet or it wasn't targeting, unless there was a rule that we're unaware of. Yeah, he, he clearly dropped the crown of the helmet, too, like right before impact. It wasn't, it wasn't like he was trying to move his head to the side, like the rugby-style tackle. He was putting the crown of his helmet right in the chest he thought the chest of burmeister but Bur burmeister went down and that brought his helmet into the target area but still like the, the main thing they want to teach these kids making tackles is not to drop the crown of your helmet and that's exactly what he did like that's the purpose of the targeting rules to stop kids from doing that um so yeah i i kind of agree with matt it's i and like you said dan i wish you could have heard the announcing at the uh at the stadium swim because that there, there had to have been something that we just don't know i guess I'm sure maybe somebody listening will, will pop in and tell us what they said. But the only explanation I heard was that he he made contact first with the shoulder, but he still lowered his yeah. head and went down for it. Like he went all for it with his head. You know, I, I don't know how that justifies anything, but what's done is done. Braxton, that was the end of his day. And it's most likely it should be the end of his this coming week. He, it, it, there's no way he should be in the game this Saturday against Hawaii. If he is, we. <laughs> <laughs> don't get me started man don't get me started hey they're talking about it man they're he's in construct he's in concussion protocol they're saying he's feeling better see this is when it's a separation to me between a, a collegiate athlete um and someone especially him who wants to get in to professional fighting and stuff afterwards um he's one i'd be extra cautious with I, I, there's no reason at this point to rush him back his last year um, he's gonna have life after. I'd I'd be the, I'd be really cautious. I'd be really conservative as far as how soon they bring him back. That was that hit was vicious. Yeah, that was. And Skinner's a big kid, so you know that's a lot of it's a lot of pressure, a lot of psi coming at you, man. So, um, yeah, I, I definitely I'm with you, Dan. I think they should kind of hey give him a break. They got a bye week after this game. Give him a couple weeks off. Let them let them recover um, completely before you get him back in there. We don't want – Hoke had a similar situation in Michigan where they let a kid keep playing after he got banged up like that. And I, I would hope that Hope Coach Hope learned something from that and doesn't repeat it. And they – for Braxton's own good, they keep him out of, out of the game. Now, this is when you know you're in a dire situation, though, because Braxton exited. And we're looking at each other like, okay, okay. Like, we all spoke about – Mr. Kyle Crum last week and like we'll be excited to see him get some snaps and kind of get, get some more experience and see what he could do out there and unfortunately man it was it wasn't pretty man it was throwing you know <laughs> throwing the lamb to to the wolves and unfortunately he I didn't understand it at the time right because he broke his collarbone and that type of injury right he, he went down and got up and I wasn't focused on him coming down off the sidelines, but then you saw him on the sideline getting walked off and just holding it like you knew he, his day was done immediately. You just you saw that walk and there was there was nothing he was going to come back from. So he's gone. Kyle Crumb's done. I mean, essentially for the year, I would think. And then you bring in third on the depth chart, you know, Leo Amave, which 
I'm also very equally as excited to see throw. But under these circumstances, it just it, there was nothing good that was going to come out of this game, and that really was the play of the game. Get, you know, knocking Braxton out and him unable to come back. I mean, that was really if there was any hope at that point, it, it was done. Yeah. You know, Amave didn't get much time with the first team offense at all this week. So that's kind of a like kind of like Crum was against Utah. You know, that's a, a no win situation pretty much. I do. I'm excited going forward to see what he looked pretty poised in the pocket to me. And I kind of like the, the presence he had. He kind of had some decent pocket feel and pocket awareness. So I'm excited to see what he does going forward with an actual yeah. week of being the guy at practice. Yeah. So he could uh, he could really spin the ball. He's that's one of the differences between him, Braxton and Chrome. Really, you see the ball come out of his hand and it's it's moving. Um, yeah, I give him credit for going out there in that in that situation. And that first throw was a dime to Shavers. <laughs> Looking back, that was a tough catch for Shavers. He had a DB hanging onto his arm, but man, we needed that play. And just for his confidence. And after that, the kind of the throws were a little bit all over the place. And uh, it's a tough situation to, to go into. But I've always, I always kind of dig watching the young quarterbacks out there trying to find their way. And the problem with the, the system, though, is it kills our quarterback. <laughs> you think of every quarterback that's ever started or played from Lucas Johnson to Brookshire, they – to you know um braxton they all get hurt you can't the system isn't isn't meant for i guess quarterback safety or like it's they they take a lot of hits and braxton brings a lot of the hits on himself are you are you done dude are you done (laughs) i'm dying because right now at this very moment we got breaking news we got breaking news fellas I, i hope that we could get to this point later in our conversation because you know i want to talk about the boise quarterback and what they were doing i want to talk about our defense and what we did but listen guys hot off the press from the ut san diego union tribune is reporting right now safety jalen maiden moves back to quarterback braxton burmeister practices so officially maiden is back in at quarterback you know, the the transfer from Mississippi State transferred over last year, got like two snaps <laughs> in the in the championship game last year against Utah State, switches to safety this past offseason. We were just talking about him last week because he was making tackles uh, against Toledo. But with this situation that we're in now, that there's no quarterbacks left on the depth chart, really. So Maiden is back. He's back at quarterback. Now, this is interesting to me, though, because, I, like I said, I hope we could have got there a little later in the conversation. But obviously, the reason, a big reason why we're down in the depth chart with quarterback arms is because Will Haskell transferred out. Now, everybody knows Heck Linsky is no longer the OC and Ryan Lindley's back at quarterback coach. A lot of shakeup after this Boise game. And one of the big things you kept seeing out there on social was like, okay, when we're going to pick up that phone and hit up Will, (laughs) he's not in the transfer portal just yet. I'm not saying that's not going to happen, but you know, when I see that, that Maiden is back, I mean, I I don't think that's likely now at this point that that Haskell returns, but what are you guys thoughts about Maiden coming back? What do you guys think? Well, the one, the positive with him is his size and physicality. Uh, He might be able to stand up, he might be one of these quarterbacks that could actually hang, and it shows the difference when you put these freshmen. They don't these they don't have that freshman twenty five or whatever they say. You know the the weight, the gain, and the strain. Um, so that's going to be a benefit, maybe. And that's I think you you put them. The question is is who's going to be the number two? If Braxton's the number one right now, which I I, I disagree that I don't believe he should be, but um, if Braxton's the number one. Then what? Who are you going to – and say he's not. Say he's not. Who who would you start? I would go with Maiden, like you said, because of his size, his physicality, and being a – Fuck it. We'll do it silent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. 
like, wait a minute. <laughs> so my internet connection went unstable on you guys. <laughs> oh, you hear me now? Uns- unstable like my knee. Okay. Um, okay, but okay, let's let's think this into the equation though, because Jeff Horton is now assuming the offensive coordinator position now, and we all know that's a running back coach, man. He wants to run the ball, so. I mean, does does that factor into it? Do you think they're gonna use Maiden as, as I mean, he is a big dude, man. Yeah, I think we can win this game just running the ball. And I'm, but I'm talking about winning the game just running the ball with the running backs. Really, like I think we could scoot through this game without having to throw the ball a lot and just get the win, get off the field, and then move forward and figure out what you want to do. Um, man, what a weird, what a Weird predicament to be. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that bye week is going to be crazy, man. I think there's going to be a lot of probably competition, like you said, for that. Who's going to be the guy behind Burmeister? Is it going to be Maiden, the big physical back uh, quarterback, or is it going to be Amave, or is it going to be one of the walk-ons? So, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see. Okay, so answer the second part of the question, guys. Does this pretty much, you know, does this pretty much close the door on the Will Haskell era here at San Diego State? Because it, like the talk was, right? I mean, he left the team. It was something that he had sat down with the coaches about. Um, and they had that conversation and came to the understanding that he was going to leave the team and pursue the transfer portal. But the rules that had been changed recently was that you cannot enter into the transfer portal officially until I believe the season is done. So this season is like limbo time, right? I mean, he's left the team. He's left the team. He's still on scholarship, still studying at state. And so, you know, there's that interesting predicament, right? That you, you pretty much, you pretty much created a situation where the young man's going to leave. And now you're in this <laughs> you're in this predicament. pickle, you're in this predicament that really you brought upon yourself. I I feel you know I, I don't want to bash, but it's like look, anything is possible. But it seems pretty much like the staff ran him off, and whether that was mainly Heklinski or what, we don't know. So, like I got like I said when we were watching the game, I was like, and all these injuries are piling up. The quarterback, I said, oh, good thing they ran out Will Haskell. We couldn't use that guy right now. So, yeah, I'm just, I, I, I don't blame him for saying, no, I'm not coming back now that you guys need me. So I, I think, honestly, I think the ship has sailed on both sides. Yeah. I, one is as crappy as what they did, letting all the news about what happened in the locker room and smoking weed, whatever, all the stupid stuff that came after fact. There's no coming back from that one way or the other. Secondly is I think with Ryan Lindley, I th- our quarterbacks are going to change the type of quarterbacks that we're going to recruit going forward. I doubt he's going to be dealing with RPO style quarterbacks. I think he'll will go back to a more traditional quarterback, um, something that he's a little bit more used to dealing with. Um, so I think probably for it's benefit of both at this point to maybe just move on and hopefully, uh, Will Haskell finds a good situation that he could get some a lot of playing time, and uh, hopefully Ryan Lindley could could recruit really well, bring in uh, a big, strong quarterback, and um, kind of fit his mold a little bit. But in general, I think talking about it at this point is probably a little bit ship sailed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is which is too bad, you know. It really is. Um, you know, I know for a fact. The young man wanted to be in San Diego. Didn't want to leave. But at this point, you know, I, I feel like there there could have been an opportunity to make it happen. But to ask people to, uh, you know, you can't really undo what's been done. But to, to still move forward together, I, I know that there probably could have been a, a possibility. The one thing point, the you're one, just not going to find that. You're just not going to. The one, I guess the 1% I'll say is, look, Ryan Lindley hasn't been here. He's not part of any of that drama. You know, he could give a fresh perspective. um, And he has some, he has a lot of credentials too that 
if if he makes that phone call and he kind of talks about when he went it down and how he could be different, how he could benefit him, there might be something there. You know, that's the Hail Mary of it. But yeah. I think in general, it's probably it's over. Yeah, for sure. Hmm. OK, OK. It was good to be back. It felt more like just being a kid. Having fun, again, playing ball out there, said made in a left-handed passer, just seeing a spark back in the offense a little bit, back out there throwing passes. I got a little rust and cobwebs off my arm, but everything felt natural. Okay, all right. All right, Maiden, number 18. Hey, if they could if they could use him how Boise used green um, last week, but they – they made some adjust. They must. They had to make some crazy adjustments on the RPO at the halftime because well, it was. They were. They were unstoppable. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about that, man. Green looked like Vince Young out there, man. Like a bigger <laughs> version of Vince Young. Like this dude was. He really lived up to the to the hype as far as a runner and being the best athlete on the field. That what Mallory was telling us last week. And he didn't look good in the first half. I mean, he threw the the tip ball. Cooper McDonald tipped it up. We got the pick. He couldn't throw anything. But in that second half, I believe Cutter is quoted. Dirk Cutter, the offensive coordinator for Boise, was quoted as saying that basically they ran like a combination of five plays in that second half, all run, you know, the option. Yeah. Because when you got that big dude like that, stop it. You know, it's like what, what, what you said, James, before. is like that's how a competent offense is when you're a machine like that. You keep doing something until you stop it. Then when you stop it, okay, well, okay, we got to make an adjustment. But that's exactly what they were doing. You know, all the different variations of runs. <laughs> what could you do? You're not going to tackle that, dude. That's basically all he did in the second half is run read option and, like, mesh plays and stuff like that the whole, the, the whole half. And it, they found success doing it. And all, all it took was uh, Taylor Green breaking a long run and that kind of, like, spread out the defense a little bit. They had to focus more on him as a runner and that opened up the inside for the, the running backs. So yeah, that's like, if we can do that, you, you can absolutely do that with Maiden. And I think Horton taking over as the offensive coordinator is the kind of guy that will do that. He'll, he'll just pound the ball like that and say, Hey, you got to stop us. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I, I, I had issues. I, I wanted the offense to advance, but like I didn't have that big of a, an issue with Horton when he was the offensive coordinator. So I, I'm to me, this isn't like a, a, a downgrade or like a, a side step or anything. To me, this isn't it should be an improvement. And especially getting a guy like Ryan Lindley to work with the quarterbacks directly. And like we were talking about, man, having him on the field, just being there as like a calming presence for those young quarterbacks as well is going to be huge. Hey, Matt, I think that's actually a great question, though, is the impact of the change from both, you know, uh, Horton going back to offense coordinator and Rand Lindley at quarterback and the quickness of the impact. Um, it's it's mid-year. You can't change the whole offense. There, we're going to do a lot of the run and a lot of the same scheme that Iglinski, um has done. I don't know what – and then the quarterbacks, who knows? They're all young. They're they're not seasoned. It's going to be hard to see improvement from there because we haven't seen any – we haven't watched them really. Um, so it's going to be hard to grade improvement on both sides. I think I, I think the benefit of the change um, isn't so much like, well, we're going to see a sudden improvement. It's just if it's not working – there's no reason to keep going at that point. Yeah. And, you know, let's start looking for the future. Let's start figuring out what we're with it, with this, the coaching staff for the future, which they still need some clarity on, but um, I'm not sure how much difference we're going to see on offense, honestly, um, well, at least, especially for, for the first few weeks. Well, Horton was running a version of this offense his last two years when they were trying to modernize it under Rocky Long. So it's not going to be, like you said, it's not going to be a vast difference, but I, I will think you'll see more power and stuff like the stuff I've been yelling at and hoping they would do. Um, you'll see more of a focus on the run and commitment to the run. And I think just the main thing that they could change right away that I think Horton could affect and Lindley is the pre-snap penalties 
and things, all the little attention to detail stuff. That's the stuff that could be affected like immediately. So I'm, I'm excited to see that. That would be improvement for me is to not have back-to-back false start penalties. Not, uh, that, we can argue about that um, illegal man downfield. I, I thought it was a BS call because I think the rule technically is as long as you're engaged with the defender, like you can be downfield. And he just let go of the defender, like right when the quarterback threw the ball. So, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, yes, I, I think that could be stuff that we could see improvement immediately. And I'll, I would take that. That that would be a win for me. Before, then, before we go any further, guys, let's let's give a quick timeout. I want to say a big thank you to everybody for who's watching right now on YouTube, right now on Twitter. Make sure you guys are are, are telling all your Aztec friends on YouTube, Stan Robinson, Sarah Eisen, Sports Fiend, of course, we all know. Eddie O says we need a new head coach. I don't know about that. Anyways, go ahead, Dan. I know Eddie O. <laughs> I, I, I know his issue. What His issue, which I mentioned it to James before, is you only have a limited amount of coaches you can have on staff. So by having Ryan Lindley at uh, – quarterback coach and only quarterback coach, that means you can't bring in another offensive coordinator um, unless another staff is let go. So he's he's thinking, man, you shouldn't have done this, should let go out and hire an offensive coordinator um, from the, the FCS level who's creative, you know, just someone who mod, has a modern offense that could be pretty explosive instead of bringing in – Lindley right now the issue with that though is what were you going to do for the rest of your quarterback coach here um it's a really tough it's a tough situation all the way around I actually think that probably Lindley will end up being offensive coordinator next year and I know he hates that (laughs) but I think that's probably what will end up happening get his feet wet the rest of this year here's what I would say to that if you bring in an offensive coordinator, more than likely he's going to want to bring in his own staff. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there's going to have to be changes in the offseason anyway if they go if they hire another offensive coordinator. So I, I wouldn't worry about the number of positions. That's important for this year. Yeah, we can't bring in somebody this year. But in the offseason, if you're going to hire a new guy anyway, he's going to want to bring in – he's going to shake up the whole staff most likely anyway. But generally what his point is is – the offense coordinator and the quarterback coach are usually the same person. Cause what other, what other staff member are you going to cut out? You know, you're not cut out your safeties coach or um, it's tough. So it's, it's an interesting dynamic. I just not anything I really want to worry about right now. Cause I actually give credit for Lindley and Horton stepping into this dumpster fire. <laughs> I mean, honestly, this is a tough situation for both to step in. Look at the quarterback situation. Look at the offense. It's the worst offense we've ever seen. Yeah. Like imagine being a coach and thinking, man, I have a game this next week with a true freshman quarterback, a safety. <laughs> I mean, this is a it's a it's a really tough situation. So I give Horton and I give Lindley a lot of a lot of credit for stepping in and trying to help out the school and the team mid year. You you give them credit for that, but on the on the other hand, the up other side of that coin is they can look really, really good by making incremental improvement. <laughs> I don't know. It's going to be hard to look good, I think. <laughs> there, there's, they can't go much further down. So Yeah, yeah I don't think they could get worse. It's just, <laughs> They're going to look like heroes. Hard, uh, <laughs> uh, so Eddie's saying, I'm talking about for next year, go, get, go offer Matt Entz or Jamie, is it Cadwell, Caldwell, over there at Coastal? Oh, yeah. 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 See, no, see, he, that's what I'm saying. That's, <laughs> but it's not going to happen, though, because they, are, they have Lindley at quarterback coach. And he knows it's not going to happen. That's why he's saying fire, fire Hoke. Right, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I can't imagine Hoke, and we're going to talk with Coach G in just a minute. You know, I can't imagine Hoke bringing in someone that's going to deviate too far from his philosophies and what he wants to have run, you know, as an offense, which I think we all are familiar with his philosophy now, his mindset and what, you know, these defensive battles, you know, Coach C, we were talking the other day and it's kind of like, hey, to a defensive-minded head coach, sometimes these aren't as ugly to them as they are to us, you know what I mean? It's like, you know. But you know what, Matt? If you read what 
Coach Hoke has been saying in the in the newspaper of late, he mm-hmm. wanted more pass. Like, balance. He, uh, balance. Yeah, he wanted more balance. Because we mm-hmm. keep saying, dude, just run the ball, you know. Yeah. But he wanted the offense to get, I think, a little bit more modern, a little bit more capable passing. Um, I mean, even he he had, it had to be tough for him to watch it too. Let's be real. Like, I mean, and one day, can we say, can I say one thing before we go on is, I think we got to talk about Coach Iglinski and not just kind of like like sweep him under the rug. Thank you. Thank because, you, yes. you know, he was a successful coach prior to becoming offensive coordinator. It sounds like he handled the situation with uh, a lot of class as far as going to Coach Hoke last week and saying, hey, if, if I'm hurting the program or whatever it may be, maybe it's time for me to leave. And, the, and these coaches – they um they change their life to come out here. You know, they uproot their family, they grow their roots, they have kids going to call high school. Um, and then we have, you know, fans as passionate we are just with with the torches out. But I th- I think he handled the situation very well. Um, how he was in within the media, how how he took ownership. He tried, he didn't want to have a crappy offense. I mean, right. Um, it just it didn't work out, but I mean we still kind of got to thank him for his time before yeah. and the second the second. And you know what? And he at, at a minimum he was a really good recruiter. He was a, a pretty quality recruiter, not necessarily with the quarterback evaluation situation, but um, in terms of just being a recruiter for other positions for the for the program. And so you know that's that's kind of a hit. Um, losing his recruiting prowess and his ability to connect with kids and their parents and stuff like that. But like you said, you know, um, it, it seemed like he handled it pretty classily, I guess <laughs> is the word with I was class, looking for. With class. With <laughs> yeah. class. Yeah. Um, and no. yeah. So, yeah. So I, I agree with Dan, like, you, you know, thank him for his time and, and you don't need to burn him on the way out, but um, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad he, we were, we're, let's move on, turn the page and thank him for his time and let's do it. V- and, you know, to that point, guys, you know, if anybody's been watching our show, listening to our show, they know that in the offseason we did have Tiffany Hecklinski on, and, and that was Jeff's wife. Uh, and they reached out to us, and that was that was a, a really, really special interview that we had, you know, for people to to actually reach out and want to be a part of what you're doing. You know, I'll, I'll forever be thankful for them in doing that and the message that she brought. And, you know, I got a chance to meet Coach Jeff and, you know, I, I have nothing bad to say. I mean, personally, none of this has ever been personal, right? We talk about the team and whatnot. But, you know, you have to remember that, like you said, Dan, they, they've been a part of the Aztec Nation since since the beginning of this turnaround with Coach Hoke. Gavin Escobar passed away the other night and it was a shock. It was a shock to everyone in Aztec Nation. Everybody was hurting. I mean, it, it hit me in the gut. I never met Gavin, but I knew he was very well respected, very well liked. He was a tremendous player. And then to see that Gavin was actually one of the first recruits that Coach Heklinski had here in San Diego that first go round because they, he was a tight ends coach. So to understand that, you know, this is this is a this is a tough business, man. It's not easy. You 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 make relationships. You know, you recruit these kids, you see them grow into men and, you know, it's not an easy job, but it's what comes with the job. And, you know, to in that community, in Aztecs community, you know, it's it's tough to do these things. But at the end of the day, um, you know, there's things that, that need to be done. But absolutely, you know, appreciate his results, work. And, it's a results based business at the end of the yeah. day. And yeah. we weren't getting results. So um, a change had to be made. That's I uh, I was sitting next to Mateo when when I probably had a bar for you when the uh, news dropped and I was like shit Mateo I actually kind of feel kind of sad for him I feel kind of kind of bad man you don't want to see people lose their jobs or be yeah. vilified or so there's there's a point where I was like oh man this sucks you know we, we all want wish it worked out better yeah we definitely do. Um... But, you know, big thanks to to the Heklinski family. I, I hope that, you know, they can forever look at San Diego State and and look at it as, you know, a, as a blessing and not not anything other than that. So 
right now we're going to take a quick Quick, quick, quick timeout, everybody. If we can go ahead and get Coach C in the room, we're going to talk with him about, you know, what he saw because Coach C was there in Boise, man. He was there, and he's got his opinions. They're, they're strong ones. Hopefully, we'll see what he has to say, and uh, let's get him in here in just a few minutes, guys. Make sure you guys are sharing the stream. We're going to be on for a little while longer. Coach C's coming up. So definitely share, retweet, you know, send the YouTube link out there and we'll get it going in just a few minutes and take a quick, 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 quick time out. <laughs> you get Coach C going, man. We could be here for another hour. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have some questions I'd like to ask them, you know.
my check bad. Mattel. Mute check Mattel. Okay, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let's 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 give it a sec. All right. Okay. Let's try that again one more time. Hopefully anybody <laughs> can hear us. Holler if you hear me, people. Holler if you hear me. All right. We're good to go. We got the green light. So so Coach C was there in Boise. He's got family out there. We're we're welcoming him to the stream. And man, it was an ugly game, but I hear I hear Boise's not too bad. Boise is a beautiful place. It was not a beautiful game. Um, definitely, it was cool to be in that Smurf turf, you know, seeing that all nine and all. But um, it was tough to watch as an Aztec fan, tough to watch as a football coach. Uh, and actually both sides, you know, it was hard watch offensively. You know, both defenses really played a lot of energy. Good football game as far as, you know, you know, good defensive football, taking advantage of things. But the adjustments Boise made, the adjustments – Coach Cutter made. I could tell he really wasn't too familiar with the Aztec defense, the 3 3 5 kind of. He was trying to do some things in the first half that really, really just kind of made it easy for the defense to kind of stop trying to force certain things. And you could tell at halftime, he just decided to go ahead and kind of break things down easy. And uh, let's just do, let's keep things simple for our quarterback. And who knew Vince Young was going to show up in the second half? That kid was something <laughs> else. And, um, you know, he was a, he had a great second half, that's for sure. And it was a problem, but it was pretty obvious what they were doing, doing a lot of wide zone run with him having the option to keep it and hold on to it or give it. And he alone demanded at least three people to have eyes on him. And that opened up everything else just by itself. And even when we did have three guys, you know, watching him, he just had the speed and his stride. Good night. His stride was something else. It didn't even look like he was moving fast, but his stride was taking up four yards per step, it seemed like. And he got around that corner. And that's not easy to do in a D1 level, to get around a fast defense like San Diego State. And he did. And once he turned that corner, it was a track meet. And he just proved he had the speed to, to make, you know, what seemed like it would be just a, maybe a three or four-yard gain. And he turned them into 35-yard gains and touchdowns. And, you know, kind of made things, uh, it softened things up. Uh, for the coach cutter, that is that, you know, what, I'm going to keep this simple because it's doing things that open up the inside zone. And it just added a lot of pressure to our offense that, boy, we we can't just lean on our defense to keep a lead. We, we got to add to this lead. And that never happened, unfortunately. So before we get into the details of our offense really quick, you know, uh, the JQ daddy on, on YouTube, Jeff Johnson on YouTube, Stan Robinson asked a question, coach. He says, why didn't we stack the box and make – him beat us with his arm green, the quarterback from boys. Yeah, it's a great question. And I think, you know, him got to remember, this was his first game that he started. And you should have heard the ovation when they announced he was going to be the starter at Boise state during warmups. They, they flashed up his, his, uh, his profile and the crowd went crazy. And this was still 20 minutes before kickoff. And uh, they were, they were frustrated. Like the Aztec fan base was frustrated and so there was just a lot of unfamiliarity on things. And then you make adjustments at halftime and, you know, the defense, they had to be feeling good. You're going into halftime, you're stopping them. They're rotating quarterbacks. You have no idea what quarterback they're going to come out. I was actually kind of surprised they brought green back out. You know, I thought Cutter was going to continue to try to throw the ball. I thought their other quarterback had a little bit of better throwing motion. I thought they were yeah. going to simplify things for him. And then when green came out, I was kind of surprised about that. And so I, I probably thought that our defense, the defensive corner probably was a little bit surprised with that too and just expected the same thing. And, you know, sometimes though our guys were in position and the guy just athletically got around the corner on things. But it's a great question, you know, stacking the box, putting that eighth, that ninth guy in there. Um, but if you haven't really focused on that during the week, if you feel like there's going to, it's going to kind of mess up responsibilities because you're adding a, a, an eighth guy and ninth guy to the box. Cause you remember it's a three, three stack, you know, and everybody has their responsibilities and you got to, what looks like it's a three safety high look with a nickel and a dime that can come and fill on the edges. It really shouldn't be an issue. What really opened up things was just their inside zone run. It just, they started gashing us up the middle. Olani had a big run. Number two, I forget his name for Boise State. He had a big run right up the middle. And it just really put us in a bad position because they showed that they had the speed, 
and their runs were very efficient. I mean, it was just a north south. And even if you try to leverage the quarterback, you know, it just made it hard. And it's hard as a coach. Sometimes you're like, man, I had the right guys in the right position and we still got beat. We still, he still got around the corner on me and that, you know, your defensive players, they come on the sideline and it's hard to tell them, Hey, you got to get a more leverage on the guy. And, you know, it's like, coach, I was there and he still got around the corner, you know, and sometimes their guys just bigger and faster. And, um, you know, not that that's an excuse. It's just a, that's really what it looked like in the second half that like, man, you know, that guy is really, really fast, you know, but you just felt like you were going to get it corrected. But it was hard. Defense got tired. We're three and out over and over and over again. You're chasing this guy around. And what they did is they really utilized what the 49ers usually do at the NFL level. Shanahan is a very, he's not a north-south kind of a, a scheme. It's an east-west scheme. They're going to stretch you by running a lot of stretch zone, uh, wide zone stuff. And if you have the quarterback that can keep it and really stretch you the opposite way, it only takes one, two steps uh, from the linebacker or whoever the force is on that weak side to take two steps inside. And that's all he needs sometime. And so, and they had the speed to get around the corner, you know, and so it was tough. It was just real tough to watch. And it was unfortunate. Mm -hmm -hmm. So when you saw our defense give up those gashing yards, I mean, at that point, the offense had done nothing, right? constant three and outs i mean is that is that a result of boise just really dominating or is that is that like a disheartening type of a reaction from the defense i mean because you know you've been there on the sidelines man this is college ball you know these, these guys aren't pros you know they got a ton of heart out there but at the same time I mean, that the way that counterbalances a team and the, the team dynamic on the sideline, like it's, to me, it's not a question of character or, yeah. you know what I mean? It's like you're getting beat out there physically and, you know, you're not getting anything from the other side. I mean, that's that's tough to, to play under those circumstances. Yeah, it's a very dangerous situation for for Coach Holt that he's got to be able to manage that. What takes uh, the heart out of any football team? I don't care if it's NFL or high school. When you start struggling to stop the run and you know that all that's what they're going to do and they're still moving chains on you, they're still getting big chunks out of you. That's the quickest way to start taking a heart out of a team. And, you know, our defense always runs on the field believing that they're going to get a three and out or you really got to do something special against them to score against them. And that second half, you really got that feeling that, you know, there was an uncertainty, man, are we going to be able to stop these guys? Because they, was, they weren't doing anything special as far as scheme-wise. They, they simplified everything for him, and they just say, hey, quarterback, you know, you be an athlete if you decide to keep it, but carry out those fakes. And linemen, we're going to go ahead and go over assignment football again on how we run wide zone. Just do your part, you know, and a quarterback, Alani, and our other running back, they're going to do their part. And because they simplified it, they were able to play a little bit quicker. So you couple that with being gassed a little bit. You couple that with what's going on in the sideline that you can tell half of your team is uh, is frustrated because they're going three and out or they're not moving chains, you know. And it's hard because as a defense, you sit down with your defensive coordinator and he's trying to talk to you X's and O. And before you can even get your seat warm, they're calling you out. Get your helmets back on, you know, punting, you know, and all. And so you really didn't even get a chance there to get chalk talk during the sideline. So even though there was, could be adjustments, the coach was not even getting the proper time to really go and specify to everyone. All right, let's go over assignment football again. We're going to make this adjustment. And you're not even finished with that sentence yet. You're back on the field again and sucks. There's another touchdown. And so now players are not hearing you no more because they're like, they're looking at the scoreboard now. Okay. Can we make a comeback with this? Now we're down, not six. Now we're down 13. Now we're down, whatever. We had a 13 at the lead. And before you blink, you know, it's 21 to 13. What happened? You know, and uh, and they didn't help to come out in the second half, you know, and our very, I think our second play, we throw a pick and, you know, they have a short field. And to me, that was the key to the game. I was talking to some of the parents. I said, the key to this game is going to be short field. Both offenses are struggling. Yeah. The special teams is going to have to be special. And if you can give your offense 
where they're starting their possession inside their opponent's uh, field every single time where they can, all they need is to get maybe, you know, 15 yards, a couple of first downs, and you're, you're kicking field goals. And it's, it's the battle between the field goal kickers and maybe somebody breaks a coverage and you can get behind someone and you get a touchdown that way. Or you score a special team touchdown, like yeah. did, right? And that was big. And it's just like, okay, you're feeling good about yourself. And there was really nothing for the defense to go into that halftime feeling like, you know, we have anything to be concerned about. And so that's part of it too, you know? And so it was kind of a, a hit upside the head of like, okay, we'll make a stop. And I even got the sense that we were going to stop him even after the interception. And then they, they score and you're like, all right, that was luck. And then, okay, we'll, we'll make the adjustments and no, and it just, it just didn't happen. And sometimes when it snowballs, communication is a real hard thing to gather, get everybody clear headed. And uh, especially when there was a lot of uncertainty with the quarterback position, you know, both our quarterbacks get hurt and you got your third stringer coming on and, you know, you're trying to find out and figure out what's his identity. What does he like to do best? And um, it's just really a, a perfect storm for Boise State, you know, in that second half for them. And, you know, you tip your hat off to them. They took advantage of uh, every little mistake we made. That was an interesting point about having enough time to coach or to make adjustments on the sideline when your offense is going three and, <laughs> three and out, you know. No, communication's key, guys. I mean, that sideline meeting time is huge. And you have to have that organized. Every player needs to go, need to know, and, you know, San Diego State does a good job of this, that, you know, you go to your spot right at halftime, you grab your water, and you sit down, and it's learning time. And a coach hopefully has something to say, something that he can give you the picture of, hey, this is what's going on, this is how we're going to adjust, or this is how I – I like what we're doing, expect this adjustment from them, and this is how we're going to counter it. And so you just got to constantly have that communication. It's an extremely difficult game. And young players that are the age group that these kids are in, you know, it's, 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 you need, they need that instruction. They need that clarity and they need that trust with one another. And there's a lot of emotion that came with this game, you know, the announcement of, Escobar passing away in a true Aztec, you know, one that we all loved and what he did and, you know, but you're pressing because, you know, you want to really put out a good showing here. It's a Friday night game. You know, it's not Saturday. You're one of the very few games. It's a big game. It's Boise State for crying out loud. Who cares about records? Records are outside the window. These are two programs that have dominated this conference now for quite a while. There's a lot of pride in the line. And for both programs, they felt like this win is it can really catapult us, you know, to get things restructured and set straight, you know, to iron out some of the wrinkles that have really been tripping us up all year. If we can get something done, because, you know, Boise State's going to be well coached. Boise State knows that San Diego State is well coached on a lot of things. You have to earn points against this Aztec defense. You don't get lucky against this Aztec defense. So I tip my hat off to them. They found a, a formula. You know, they had the kind of kid that can do it. Um, he, he showed out, you know, it was a great game for him, you know, and it's just too bad that we couldn't battle in a way where, you know, it was, it just, it got away from us. And I've been in part of both games where everything seems to be going your way. Wow. That was great. And then everything also seems like it's just not going your way. And you're like, man, we were right there and it's still, you know, it still worked out for them. And, you know, and you just got to make sure you manage the emotions of that team, that flight home, I'm guarantee was a tough flight home. And, and, and I guarantee that Sunday or Saturday meeting in this case, that coaches meeting, it wasn't mainly X's and O's. It was how are we going to manage the emotions and the psyche of this team going forward? We got to win them over. There was a lot of frustration on that sideline. It just wasn't in the stands. I was frustrated. Oh my goodness. I was frustrated as an Aztec fan. But as a coach, I'm just focusing on the sideline because I want to read body language. A coach needs to read body language. You have to be able to see in a guy's eyes if he's going to be OK, you know, because it tells you a lot. And there was a lot of our leaders and I thought they handled themselves well, but there was a lot of frustration by our leaders. And, um, and as a coaching staff, if your leaders are showing frustration that are getting to the point where you have to bring them back in, hey, let's get refocused and all. 
then you got to know that the rest of the team is going to kind of follow suit with that. And so you have to really make sure that this week, you know, who cares who the opponent is right now, the biggest opponent is San Diego state. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta fight that. You gotta win this first practice this week and it's going to be a fluid practice. It's got to be one where there you go. That's how you do that. That's exactly how I want you to, you know, a lot of pats on the back right now and get them believing that, you know what, if we're going to do this and turn this thing around, it has to be together. And I mean, all of us, coaches and players, all is one. We're all hurting, you know, but we all got to do this together. And I need you guys to be locked in no matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you're a redshirt freshman, a true freshman, super senior, or the guy. Now's not the time to be selfish. Now's not the time to take any of this stuff, you know, where you just say, I got to get mine type attitude. That right there, you got to make sure you nip that in the bud. Because uh, all of all of Aztec Nation, if you will, they're hurting right now. We want to see a dub, and we need a big win in a big way. Coach, see, so, I, I was going to ask you. I know it's kind of changing subject, but you talked about Monday practice. Talk to me about the changes that the offensive coordinator and quarterback coach can make in this short of a time, in this short of a season. And the impact that they could have not only this week versus Hawaii, but ongoing um, for the rest of the season. Well, the first thing you're going to do, especially if you're coming uh, or you're just brand spanking new. And what I mean by that, you haven't been with the team all year. You don't want to get too crazy. The last thing what was frustrating last week is, man, we're inside the five yard line and we're doing all this movement, shifting strength, yeah. tight end movement, and it just causes a chance to get a false start here and there. You don't go on to, you don't have a lot of movement. And next thing you know, we're going backwards on a snap before the ball or before the ball's even snapped. A lot of before the snap flags we got. We heard ourselves, I think I counted eight by mid third quarter. And that was frustrating. You really need to, as a as the guy coming in, where if you're going to be the play caller, you look at that playbook, you watch a lot of film, and you simplify things right away and you get back to fundamentals. And this engine needs to be fixed. I like the pieces. I like the running back room a lot. I like the quarterbacks. Even like what I saw with the third string quarterback, I like our receivers. Um, I like our tight end, you know, and the O-line, we need to help them out a little bit with uh, some three-step stuff. Too much, I felt, that, you know, where our quarterbacks are dropping back and having to hold the ball a little bit. Man, we need to get you know, more efficient with their passing game. I felt, I thought we could have helped out our quarterbacks a little bit by, you know, getting a one step and throw three step, get rid of the ball. Now really simplify. Here's the coverage that we're seeing. Here's our options right here. Make your read and pull the trigger, get rid of the ball, give our wideouts a chance to make a play. And if they fall four and give us three, great. If they end up making a play and giving us seven or moving the chains for us. Wonderful. That's that is a little pick me up. And so what you really want to do is you really want to simplify things, but you got to look at the playbook. What is it you guys know? He's got to learn the language just in case anything was changed um, that he doesn't understand and, and make sure that he, he becomes a quick study on the language of it. And then this week, you know, this is going to be what, these are the 10 pass plays. These are going to be our play action. And these are going to be our best runs that I'm seeing from you guys, you know, and we got to perfect them. And, with the passing game, there's so much with the passing game. It's not just we got a quarterback that can throw and we got receivers that can catch. Linemen have such intricate responsibilities with every pass play, and that includes the quick, the quick game. The running backs, you got to know pass protection schemes, you know, like crazy. The quarterback's got to feel comfortable. He cannot be a guy that is not too sure if we got the right protection. And he can be a guy that's not too sure on the coverages. There's got to be something. If we get a single high or two safety high look and you see corners off, you're going to pick a side. All right. And your, and your pre-snap is going to be what side you want to go on. And your post-snap is what receiver you're going to go to. And you just got to really simplify things down and just demand perfect execution. I've been coaching a long time. Coaches that are, uh, I guess their forte is the passing game. They're probably the most cockiest co coaches out there because they know that's a complex part of the game of football and they know everything and they're a little cocky, but they're very demanding too. I know I was that way. I, 
if if my tackle did not cut block on a on on a three step or if it's shotgun on a one step, I'm screaming and yelling at the guy. You know what I mean? Because that is so essential. You got to be getting hands down to open up pass lanes to make this play work. There's nothing more frustrating to have a DB who's playing 10 yards off a receiver where you can just throw a quick hitch and a defense and knocks the ball down because I have a tackle who decides that he's going to get in a true pass set. And I got two big bodies in the way of my quarterback. You can't have that. And so, you know, and I'm sure the coaching staff at San Diego state was pushing that and you got to, you got to demand it from the players and, and really make them recognize how important every little detail is it's the same with the running game. You got to read the box to cur- if you're going to run power, you better know who's got who. I you know there's nothing more frustrating for a, a play caller with me if I have a pulling guard and him and the and the fullback are going after the same guy, you know, and it drives me. And now you got a backside linebacker scraping and making a play for a three yard loss, you know, because you have a guard that's not too sure what he's looking at, or you have a front side tackle going to the wrong guy. It's you have to be demanding. You have to ask for perfection. You have to demand perfection. And, and you do it in a way that keeps the kids positive, of course. You know, these kids are smart. We've known that we've been able to run the ball, you know, with quite effectiveness for years past. We still can. And I know this offense, they have the tools that, that can get it done. You know, it's just, it's just tough. New quarterback this year, bring in another quarterback. You know, Haskell, of course, he had his style things. And unfortunately, that, you know, that didn't work out. Now you got a freshman quarterback that, you know, I liked what I saw, but I liked what I saw from Crum. And I also liked what I saw from Burmeister as far as the physical skill set. He's like, there's something here that you can work with. It's just yeah. about getting it done. This is some of the comments we're getting on YouTube is that, like, this quarterback room is – it's probably one of the more talented quarterback rooms we've had as a whole in a while, right, guys? I think we all, all admit that. In your opinion, though, was was this offensive scheme – was it a little too complicated for for the team, for the offense, for the offensive line? Was, was it a little too complicated, or was it perhaps just, you know, not 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 detailed right? or enough well it wasn't executed in a way that even the simple stuff wasn't executed well and right you have to be able to execute simple you have to be able to execute simple and your first and tens are so key for a team like san diego state you got to stay ahead of the chains you can't find yourself in third and longs and if you're a running team and that's your identity and you're trying to adopt passing concepts then you might be going at it the wrong way. You know, you have to go where you say, no, we have to do these concepts right, and it will automatically open up our, our run game. And so I'm telling you guys, there's a special way you run hitch, and the inside receiver does not run hitch the same way as an outside receiver. Quick outs, those are – and there's certain coaches, they, they're scared to death of quick outs. I'm not saying this is the case for San Diego State, but there's a personality that comes with – passing the football and it's just there's so many details that have to be executed and I'm sure it's frustrated frustrating for the coaching staff whenever they would call a three-step quick pass play and it get knocked down or something else and you know and it might be because you got a new lineman there that oh I forgot coach and you just can't be making that those kind of mistakes you know you just can't and if your quarterback isn't really understanding progressions really well yet and he's having to hold the ball a little bit longer yeah you're going to get quarterbacks hurt and like we've had and you know you really got to help protect him and there's just so much you can do to help out screen game draw lead draws you know things of that nature that if you're going to say all right we're going to become a a passing team and I don't mean that ideally but we're going to really make sure that we do the passing game right you got to make the decision how much you're going to invest in the time to to do that in pass protections in a two back set in a one back set in a no back set guys are all that that's a lot of work i watched a seven hour instructional video video by alex gibbs on just teaching inside zone and it was seven hours long because he's talking to florida gators he's the great o-line coach the late o-line coach from the denver broncos back in the day of terrell davis and those guys and his first question to them are you guys using a fullback or you're not you're gonna be single back or two back 
And they said, we want to do both. And he says, well, that's just going to double the hours of what we need to spend. It's going to be a 14 hour lecture. And, but you do it. And, but it's one thing for the coaches to get it. Now we got to make sure the players get it. How do rules change? Because now we have a fullback in the backfield and we want to run inside zone or if we're running a three-step pass protection scheme and I got two backs in the backfield, how do those rules change? And it's a lot of work. And, and, and so college football has kind of gone the opposite direction. The reason why they've gone to a, a RPO, they've really streamlined it where it's just all about tempo now. It's not really about a thick playbook. It's about doing things fast, keep in place simple um, and get rid of the ball, you know, or you make a decision whether you're keeping it or giving it to the running back and just you're constantly pushing the ball forward and trying to get the defense tired and hopefully they make a mistake and you break a big one, you know, and that's why you see Alabama do it now because Alabama finally figured out why are we trying to do things the old school way? We have the best athletes so they can take advantage of little tiny mistakes better than anybody USC, Oklahoma, all these schools did that. And it's just, let's just get an athlete at quarterback and, and let him do his thing and, and play high tempo football, you know? And so it's really, you got a lot of new young coaches. That's easy to them, you know? And, you know, it's, it's ABC. And there's a lot of old dinosaurs like myself that they were about the two back, one back, no back stuff. Let's teach it all. But it's a lot, guys. That's a, that's a, that's that's calculus level type stuff because you're just really teaching out and can you trust these 18 year old through 22 year olds who might leave early, who might transfer the next year, um, you know, you're, and, and your job's on the line, right? So you don't have time to tell the alumni, you know, hey, they're growing. They, they, they want to see dubs, you know, they want to see that scoreboard rung up and, you know, they're putting 60 on the board. How come you're not, you know? Yeah. And so you got to really fight that. You got to get, you got to have a great sales pitch. Guys, got any questions for for Coach Man before we kind of move on to a different topic? No, I think we're good, man. You, Dan pretty much hit the two on the head that I was interested in. So yeah, it's good, good stuff. Well, let me set the table for you, Coach, because listen, Jeff Heklinski is out as offensive coordinator after that game. He's he's out. You know, the the Aztec Nation made their voice heard, and you know things had to be done. So. We're four, what, four or five games in? Like, this is, you know, hey, first conference game. And now it, tra- it changes over to Jeff Horton, who was the previous pre- previous offensive coordinator in our back-to-back championship run. And so he was the running backs coach. So I don't think terminology or any of that stuff should be, you know, that big of an issue or anything like that. But he assumes the new offensive coordinator position. Ryan Lindley gets hired away from Mississippi State like takes a flight like that and he's back in San Diego back home where he's from right he's like what the all-time quarterback so anyways he assumes the quarterback coach spot and now we just got news tonight before you came on that Jalen Maiden who was a Mississippi State transfer quarterback last year he saw maybe you know two three snaps last year in total at the quarterback spot he was changed to safety this offseason well, now, because the depth chart is so low because injury, well, now he's sliding back into that third third deep quarterback spot. So a lot of moving parts, a lot of, you know, a lot of uncertainty going on. But, you know, the, the two certain things is that we know that Jeff Horton is the offensive play caller now. He's a, a run first mentality guy, right? Running backs coach. And with. Ryan Lindley coming in as the as the quarterback coach. I mean, what what what, what should we be expecting? I think and I know you said guys simplify things down after this season. I mean, I don't know what what is your guys' insight. I mean, is this what do you guys think, man? Is this kind of like a long term? Is this a, a band aid? Is this is this <laughs> Eddie O says Lindley bringing the air raid with him? Right. Yeah. yeah. He was a defensive analyst at Mississippi State. You know, he wasn't r- helping out the offense there with uh, who, who's oh, the coach there, the pirate. That, that's a good question for Coach C. So Lindley was a defensive analyst at Mississippi State. <laughs> Do you think he still had some interaction with Mike Leach, like talking offense? Because you were a graduate assistant as well at San Diego State under Kraft. Did you were you able to like pick Kraft's brain and like talk to the offensive staff, even though you were technically a defensive 
analyst or graduate assistant, however you want to call it. Um, w- would there still be interaction like that? Oh, yeah, no doubt. And it's something that um, it's going to actually make Lindley even more more versatile in the respects that when you're on one side of the ball and it just helps you get in their minds. I mean, you got to remember, he played for Arizona Cardinals, and so he's he's bringing that, what he learned at the quarterback position from that. Um, you know, and he went through his little, I think, doubts at San Diego State. Is he the right guy? But then he just was just solid. He just understood how to manage the game of football really well. And he's coming from that where we run power and we run play action. That's who we are, you know, and I think that's what you're going to see, honestly. I think what good teams need to do is you get back down to the basics and we got to win the trenches. And for Lanley to be on the defensive side of the ball, I know as a GA, what you do is you run the scout deep. Versus your own offense. So you better know your own offense. Okay. And, and you're in the, every offensive meeting room. So as whoever the head coach, in my case, coach Kraft, as he's X and O and everything, and you know, how we want to attack defenses, you're in those meetings. But at the same time, when our offense is on the field during practice and I have to, I had to learn all the defenses that we're going to face that week. And then I had to teach it, you know, to our boys, you know, how to run certain coverages the way they'd like to disguise things and, you know, what the thought process is there. So it really helps you out versatile that you're getting both sides of the ball really well. Um, I didn't feel very confident as a coach until I started learning O-line stuff. O-line stuff is where it's at. Once you understand protections really well, and trust me, not all the coaches do at all levels. They, if they're a receiver coach, that's what they know. You know what I mean? They know receivers, they know running backs. And then you got some that, they bounce around. If you've heard anything from Belichick, he makes all his coaches do everything. They're going to learn everything because it makes you into a better positional coach and a coordinator. And so this experience by Len Lee to be on the defensive side of the ball with his offensive background on top of that, uh, with his love for Aztec football, because he's an Aztec and really kind of being in the same situation of just let's learn how to do things the right way and keep it simple. And you keep things simple, even for the talented quarterbacks, until they prove to you that they can go ahead and take that to the next level, you know. And sometimes they do it too soon. It's great play. Like the green kid there at Boise State, you know, it's, that's probably what they did. Right, like recognizing the first half, you know, we try to give you something and ah, we gave you too much too fast, you know, and just be you and we'll slowly start ironing this thing out. So for our quarterback, if it's the – the quarterback that ended the game last week, if it is, you know, there are some good things that you saw physically he can do. Now let's get it to the point where he can feel confident in executing well, but more than anything, you want to make sure he has the belief in the pass protection. And this is what I'll be telling the quarterback. If I was in that quarterback room right now and I'm talking to, you know, our quarterbacks, you're going to learn pass protections. You're going to learn to protect yourself. That what every pass play I give you, you make sure that box has got what it needs in order for you to go through your reads, you know, because if someone's coming in free and you should have known that guy was coming in free and you get popped, that's your fault. You better know protections and you make sure that running back in the backfield, he knows them as good as you do. You make sure that communication is solid. And that starts from the OC. You will know protections. That is the most important thing for a quarterback to know. Then the run game and putting ourselves in a good run play. You know, and keep it simple for the kid. You know, it's like, hey, if I'm going to give you an eye formation and and Horn's giving you a power play, but he might say, but I'm going to give you a kill call now with this, that we might want to go ISO instead of power because they overload it, you know, and give it simple. Point out the mic, make sure you're in the same communication and give yourself a chance as a quarterback that you feel like you really have two hands on the wheels, on the wheel the whole time that I'm putting ourselves and our offense in a great position. And even if you go three and out, you missed a throw that was wide open or a bad read. You're the first guy telling that receiver, hey, I missed you, Dana. I'm going to get you on the next one, though. You know, that's my bad right there. And you need that kind of communication because if you got a receiver head down, I was wide open, I beat my guy, and you threw it eight feet over my head, you know, a quarterback's got to win him back over. And, and the OC has to do the same thing. You know, hey, man, that was a bad call on my part. I like how you're playing right now. You know, this is what we're going to go with. You know, and if you want to check with something, here's your two options. And this is what I want you to look at. And that this week is going to be about that. You know, here's the playbook. We're going to stream it down. 
I'm going to give you two calls per formation, per play, you know, do simple. Let's see if we can get four or five per play, you know, and if we find ourselves in third and tens, and I tell you what, during situational periods, you practice third and longs all week long because it only takes 30% of those that you execute during the game to give yourself a chance. You're not going to get them all. You're not going to get 50% of them. But if you can rise that percentage to about 30%, now you got the team kind of feeling kind of good. You know, you're, you're doing things well. You got a couple of first downs. You're giving your defense an extra two to three, four, five minutes of rest, you know, and you challenge the defense because that's where the alphas are for this program the last few years. And you challenge them. You get that position, that field position working for us, you know, and you be patient with our guys and you tell those defensive leaders, you be the first guys to high five these young quarterbacks, these young, you know, <laughs> offensive players, because they want to do right and they want to play hard, but they're going to make mistakes. And as long as you set the expectation to be a realistic expectation and you really communicate what your role is as the leader, you know, I'm going to McDonald and I'm saying, McDonald, if you start seeing that defense body language kind of here we go again, I'm counting on you to strain that out. You don't let our team get to that point right now. You know, yeah, it's frustrating. We're all frustrated, but I need you, McDonald's. I need you, Matthews. I need you, Bird. All you guys that this program is all about right now, you be the guys that keep everybody up and you just fight. And we get 60 minutes of hard football by all you guys, then whatever the score ends up being, it ends up being. But I need you guys giving 110% all the way, go 120 miles an hour and demand perfection and hold each other accountable, including the leaders, you know, and it starts from the coach. He's got to be very clear with what he's, he's going to expect from those guys. And it's easy to jump on the, on the guys that I'm going to a lot of playing time. You got to be able to jump on the guys that, you know, as far as what they're presenting on that football field. And, you know, we're used to seeing our guys play well. This is a tough year to take, no doubt. You know, you're coming off of a, what was it, 12-1 and one last season, you know. But it's just here we are. It's a good challenge. It's a good learning challenge for these guys. And I think they can do it. I really do. And I, I think we have the right leadership, you know, in this program to – take on this challenge and grab the bull by both horns. And let's see, let's see. Well, I'm glad they made the the changes, you know, to us, we had been calling for it, a full, full admission, you know, but you, you had to make those changes and show that leadership had to. And with changes like that, Matt, you have to tell the team, Hey, expect it not to go smooth right away, guys. You know, it's, it's a new play caller, you know, it's a young quarterback. There, there might be a big mistake there. And so you challenge the team during that team meeting. How are you going to respond when that adversity knocks on your door again and it's right there and it's early? You know, there's still it. there's still a lot on the line this year. Absolutely. There's you know, still so many games to play this year. So you paint the picture. Here's the challenge. You mm -hmm. set a practice this week with those kind of scenarios, you yeah. know, where – you're yelling at your defense on the field right now after two plays of offensive, you know, situational, and there's been a pick or whatever outs, and you put them in that position and you want to see how they handle it mentally. You make them mentally strong by just constant adverse situations, but you execute simple in those adverse situations. Can you break down, you know, here's the storm is raging. Can you stay focused on how we're going to run power? You know, when they've loaded it now with that ninth guy in the box, can we still do it? And you communicate, you know, and if you pick up four, now you're like, there you go, you know. And so it's 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 going to be challenging. It's going to be fun. I, I I expect that we'll be all right. So so we got Hawaii this weekend coming up, which Hawaii is one of the worst FBS teams out there. But given our situation, you know, I don't know if Burmeister is going to start. He's. He did practice today, and I think they have him listed as the starter so far. Coming off that concussion, that's going to be tough. So we got boy, we got Hawaii, then we got a bye, and then we have Nevada on the road and Fresno State on the road, and then home against UNLV. That's a tough three game stretch. I mean, Nevada may not be as difficult as Fresno State and UNLV, and Fresno State Hainers. I don't know if he'll be back by the time we play him. Jake Hainer, he's been out so. There's potential, you know, they can get themselves together and, and, you know, put a game plan together, get this team, like you said, get them united in the same direction and everybody buys in to, I mean, it's a challenge. It's a big challenge. 
Yeah, right now the most important thing is tomorrow's practice. They, they don't need to be well focused on who cares what the helmet is across from the you mm -hmm. on Saturday. It's it's right now the team has to internally tighten up every bolt that they feel is loose. And that's the coach's job. That's the new coordinator's job. It's a tough job. And that's the leaders of this program. And you look internally and as a program, let's tighten out every bolt and just work on being efficient uh, and, and laser focus on you. Get you right, you know, and come Saturday, you know, if you're running power correctly, you're running your quick game real, you know, easily, you're protecting your quarterback, you know, that's what you're going to come off the side on saying, hey, great job on that execution. You know, even if it didn't end up in seven, man, you executed, you threw it off a little bit, but you executed the way I wanted it to. Now let's get it right. And you have to make sure when you're the captain of a ship that's going through a storm and San Diego State's going through a storm, no one's comfortable, no one's happy. You know, this is not a smooth sea right now. We don't like it. How come we're not six and oh right now? What's going on? You know? And it's because things happen. It's life. Oh, well, you know, and you're just kind of like, let's just get this ship. And it takes all mates on deck, you know, do what you're supposed to do. And tomorrow's practice is the most important day for this season for San Diego State. And and then you get that done right. Did we execute red zone? Did we, uh, you know, execute third and longs today after practice? And then tomorrow's the next day that we got to do it again. And once you start getting consistency and you start getting confident level, of what we're doing, that when we get in the five yard line, inside the five yard line, here's the five plays you're going to hear me call. These are it. These are the three pass plays. Here's the two run plays. There ain't going to be no confusion whatsoever. I could care less that Hawaii or whoever Ohio State knows it's coming. I need you to execute your job, you know, and what we're going to do. We're going to go on one and we're going to hit it, you know, and you just punch it is what you do. And Mistakes that are made, you coach that up when they come off the field, you know, and it's like, hey, you know, you missed the guy, whatever else. And if it's the extra guy, then that's on me as a coach. I, I have a play for that guy. But if you got a hat on a hat, according to the way we drew it up and the way we wanted you to block it and you got to your man and they still stuffed it, I can build off of that. But if I'm going backwards five yards because we got a guy, I thought I heard it was on two or when a tight end jumps up to motion and change the strength and the tackle, you know, who's itching to, you know, run over this guy. He jumps a little bit. He flinches, you know, and we're going back. Those little things just cause young teams that feel the pressure, puts their head down, and now they're hitting their head because I made another mistake. And now they're looking at the sideline. Am I going to get pulled? And there's just a lot of extras that they don't need to be worried about. They need to be laser focused. And it starts tomorrow, started yesterday, and it needs to continue tomorrow that when we get into these situations, this is what you can expect. And that communication by Horton, by Lindley, all of those guys, it's got to be as clear as a bell to these kids. I'm, I'm just fascinated with having Burmeister in there now. It's going to be a totally different style, I think. I mean, from what we're all saying here, running power, that's what we're used to seeing with – with the Jeff Horton offense, right? I mean, do you guys think uh, he'll be able to uh, to operate this offense? And he's used to being out there, being a running quarterback, you know? Yeah, they'll still be able to do all that running stuff yeah. with him. I would well, not – I kind of don't want him to because of the concussion thing. But, but yeah, you can still do all of that stuff in, in the way Horton runs the offense. So – yeah, I would stay away from QB power, but you know, <laughs> as far as the blocking scheme is concerned, and I get it. Ooh, he was it running gets, that a lot. He'd been running that a lot. Yeah, and you gotta, you know, I I would just and even if they decide to keep things the same, status quo, just iron out the wrinkles that you have because I'm seeing a lot of off coverage. I'm seeing Matthews having DBs that are way off of them. Get them the ball real quick. Let them do certain things. Um, you know, and making sure that the quick game gets ironed out. That helps out your running game, too, because you got to force the defenses to have a two safety high look. That helps out your run box. We got the running backs in that room that are shifty enough and are physical enough to to do their job with that. And our old linemen, if you're helping them out, it's, it's not hard to, you know, hey, there's six in the box. This is how we're going to block inside zone or power, um, you know. There's five in the box. This is how we're going to do it. And, you know, maybe, yeah, because of the quarterback situation, maybe quarterback power or quarterback anything, him running the ball, maybe I throw that out the window. 
you know, and it, but that's a big play, part of their offense. Well, not this week. Right now, we just need to get it where we stay healthy, get the ball out of your hands. And I think you're going to just see a better morale from the team when they, yeah. they we're going to lean on you guys more. And, and Burmeister, you know, let's be let's let's get these guys involved quicker. And, um, you know, and it's not totally his fault. It's, like I said, it's everyone that there's just there's no doubt the former O.C., you're always going to have your moments, man, I should have did this better. I should have ironed out this first. I should have attacked this sooner than what I did. We all go through that guys. We do it every, after every drive. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's just like, yeah. man, you're kicking a field goal instead of a touch. I should have called this play instead. I knew it, you know, and, and you always kick yourself. It's the I game. think this will be a spark. I think so, this will be a spark. My, uh, Mo, Mo Mama asked us, do you think it'll be a spark with the new OC and quarterback coach? And I, I think it will, you know, a, a little breath of fresh air. It's a challenge, but, you know, hearing a different voice, having that different energy, different style, I, I think it is going to propel them. Guys, what are we thinking about the Mountain West we, before we shut things down? What do you guys think about the Mountain West, in, especially in the Western Division, man? Who's on top right now? It's got to be UNLV, right? <laughs> Coach C, you're in Vegas right now, man. UNLV's playing some good ball. Yeah, they're, they're playing pretty well, man. They're defensively surprising me how yeah. well they're playing defensively. So that's that's a scary game all of a sudden. Yeah, they're excited here in Vegas for them. And Coach Arroyo was actually – my brother was a backup quarterback when he was at San Jose State to Coach Arroyo. So what? he's a good dude. I'm happy for him. He, I think he first started his first 20 games without a without a win or 11 games. And, you know, it's just something that I'm happy for him. I don't want him to win the conference, obviously. I'm an Aztec through and through, you know. But when you're new, you don't know how to win yet. You know, even though things are going your way. And so it's kind of like Aztecs got to know we have the leadership that knows we're used to being, you know, in the thick of things. And I won't be surprised if we do get things turned around because of our leadership. They demand a high level from themselves. They're used to executing at a high level. That's why you see the frustration that you're seeing. And it's just not from the fan base. It's from the players as too, because they're used to being the big dog, you know, and and when it's not happening, when you had high expectations like they had, we all had, you know, that that kind of is a slap in the face sometimes. And like what's going on? Sometimes you struggle too fast to get it fixed and you try to shoot a 10 point basket rather than just getting one simple bucket at a time. And that's why I say with practice, tomorrow's practice is the most important. Get your layups down right. Don't miss layups anymore. When you're at the two, hmm. punch it in. You know, we can't afford that. And in quarterback, don't worry about the three-pointer. Make the correct feed. Make the correct pass. And it's sometimes you missed out on a home run, but you gained eight, you know, and you got rid of the ball fast. And everybody just do their job. And that's going to start from Coach Hoke. He's got to have the message that, you know what, today's a new day. And you got to get the team to buy into that. And they got to see it in him. They got to see that energy from him. He's the guy. You know, and he's got to get everybody going and he's going to have to look at that defense. I still need you guys. You got to leave this thing still tired or not, you know, and then quarterback. Yeah, you're young, you know, or Burmeister. Yeah, you're hurt. You know, you need to make good, great decision. And O-line, if he needs you to hold it an extra second, you got to do it. You know, you just got to do it. Everybody's got to be willing to do a little extra and they got to see it at practice this week. And that's what's going to make the team telling you when you have three or four positive practices like man we're starting to get this it's starting to look easy you know especially when our ones are facing the ones at practice against that defense that can fly around and you get a couple of you know red zone periods with the ones and you score those are confident builders and all and a lot of times guys in football a lot of times you don't see offenses that are that have a great defense if you will a lot of times their offenses aren't that great because they don't build confidence during practice because every time it's the ones versus ones, you know, during that practice period, the defense is just dominated because they're just that good. And it's tough and you don't really see success happen at practice and you just hope during the game that you do see it, you know, and sometimes it's that way and, or it's flipped the other way where offense is just so dominant and the defense is just you know, getting worked every practice when it's ones versus ones. And you got to challenge your guys and just say, hey, we got to win. You know, you got to win. And that's why I'm saying you simplify things. You say, yeah, that's a great defense. Let's go hit them in the mouth during that period and see what you guys are made out of and just get some confidence in those guys and then challenge those ones. 
Don't let them off the hook, you know, and um, it's going to be right, an interesting coach. thing to see. I'm going to have to throw in that. We let them off the hook sound bite right there. <laughs> <laughs> Coach C, thank you for your time, man. This was a wealth of knowledge. Everybody in the chat is real thankful for it and answering questions. I've been trying to mix them in there and, you know, appreciate your time, man. Being out there in Boise and getting to see it firsthand, I, I know it was eye-opening on a lot of different fronts. And, man, we thank you. We'll, we'll get together later this week and see what's up with some game film. But, yeah, man, appreciate your time, dude. My pleasure. My pleasure. Good seeing all you guys. All right. Thanks, Cody. All right, James. All right, Dan. See you, man. All right, fellas. Well, what do you guys think, man? Coach dropped a dropped a lot of knowledge on us. <laughs> so that, that was a lot of insight, man. That was. <laughs> I, th I think, uh, like, the main point is, is you know, like, simplify it. Be good at the uh, at the at the most simple terms, and once you have that mastered, maybe start expanding a little bit. But um, don't go. Don't try to shove too much in there. Make it simple. Um, and that's, you know, let's just do what you could do. Don't have too much on the menu. Be like in and out <laughs> Just make a cheeseburger, yeah, hamburger, exactly. fries, yeah. maybe some animal fries if you get that mastered down. Exactly. You, yeah. And he made some good points about all the movement with tight ends in motion. And like, <laughs> it says it was, it looks way more complex than it needed to be, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking at Shanko Shankopotamus says coaches pumping sunshine up our blank. <laughs> I don't think so, man. Here's the thing, because and I'll tell you right now, Shankopotamus. Uh, no, I think he he pointed out. Look, the old offense was it was it wasn't run really well. They weren't executing, you know, clearly or anything as you know well. So it's like you got to go down to the basics. This team, we know that there is talent on the offensive side of the ball. There's a lot of talent. So if you could just simplify it. Like you're saying, run these things, execute cleanly and efficiently. They can win these games. The Mountain West is not the SEC, guys. Like, we can make this happen. I mean, we're, we're not expected to be national championships, you know, but this team is – they won 12 games last year, a lot of turnover, I get it. But, uh, man, you know, simp simplify some things down. I, I think they can get back on track. Yeah, I'm starting to get excited. I'm excited to see – the, the little differences in the offense. Yeah. You know, I'm excited to see kind of Lindley being on the field, helping coach up the quarterbacks. So I'm starting to get a little pumped up about it. I'm, I'm kind of at the, the change we all agree needed to happen. So I'm right. I'm glad they ripped the bandaid off. I was worried it was going to be like an all year thing. We're going to have to just talk about it all year. Yeah. yeah. And I wasn't looking forward to that. Yeah. You know, no, it's interesting. He, he, he emphasized communication. And one of the things that we always talked about is like, you know, with the, both the coordinators up in the press box, like, how do you communicate? You know, how do you get the message across? How do you calm your team down? Um, it's, I assume Ryan Lindley is going to be on the sideline. So that already for me, that's just a pet peeve I had was you have these young quarterbacks out there or, or even veteran quarterbacks. So you don't even have a coach on the sideline that, you know, could talk to yeah. them, could calm them down, you know? So that in itself is, it's going to be interesting for me just to see to have a coach there that's been through it all that, you know, could talk yeah. to him. And who's coached, you know, top college quarterbacks during wow. their draft process. Right. You know, he's, he's been there. He, he knows how to pour in that confidence. So listen, guys, it's late. But listen, everybody who's checking out this stream, we appreciate you guys on Twitter, on YouTube. We, we might have to do this another time, but you know, I appreciate you guys for joining. It's going to be a long, busy week. It was a long weekend for us. We're all we're all gassed, man. We're all gassed. So, you know, on, on, on behalf of Coach C and all of us here at Sons of Montezuma, you guys be sure to check out more coming down the line this week. Big game against Hawaii. Any, any score predictions, guys? <laughs> oh, man. I, I have no idea where to go. Because um, Hawaii has looked pretty bad at points this year. So, yeah. But so is our offense. So <laughs> who, uh, we're all excited about the, the change, but I think like we talked about, it's going to be incremental. Yeah. So, I, you know, let's just get a win. the defense plays well. <laughs> just I want a solid win. It doesn't matter. I don't care what's yeah. the final score. Yeah, this is one of those games where I'm not going to care about style points at all. No. I'm just going to be uh, thankful to walk out, 
uh, with the wind. It's weird when you when you're struggling like this, you take you, like you stop taking for granted all those ugly wins, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like when you're getting your butt kicked, like give me that ugly San Jose State win last year any day of the week. Yeah, I'm excited for the first night game, man. That's yeah, yeah. I'm kind of pumped about that. Yeah. Well, so. the guys are gonna need our support, so all you Aztecs fans, make it out there, show up. First night game. Hey. We got 23 to six, six to nothing. Well, <laughs> I'll take a win, however it comes. All right, everybody. Sons of Montezuma.com. Make sure, <laughs> make sure you go support. Go buy some gear. <laughs> James, K5 James, Durball Dan. We'll talk later this week, guys. Thank you for uh for uh joining us as long as you guys did, man. All right, no problem, man. Go Aztecs. Go Aztecs. <laughs>